right now I have a goal to reach 100,000 100, steps for the awareness of the opiate crisis that's around us. Tonight, steps to stopping a crisis. An addictions counselor walks for opioid addicts. The Pope can come right to my door and apologize to me, but it won't make a lick of difference. Mixed feelings about the Pope's impending quest for forgiveness. I revel in its quietness and evocative solitude. And it's the dawn of a new artistic era in the nation's capital. I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. We begin in Ottawa, where a Senate committee report is calling for forced sterilization to be outlawed in Canada. A report released Thursday morning also recommends compensation to victims. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. It is one of the Canadian medical system's darkest practices. The act of doctors sterilizing women against their will and marginalized groups such as Indigenous women are more often than not the victims. A new Senate report aims to end the practice for good. The report co-author Senator Yvonne Boye says criminalizing the procedure is an essential first step. I believe there's sterilizations happening today as we speak. The, the, re, the, re, the calls that I get in my office tell me that, that women are still being coerced into sterilization, women that are pregnant even are being coerced into having that tubal ligation. Another co-author, Senator Michelle Odette, adds if women know doctors could face hard consequences as a result of the practice, they are more likely to come forward. If a woman or a family knows that there is a legislation that exists uh, in Canada uh, to protect her, specifically for this, we're giving uh, a voice dignity and a chance to make sure that she use her rights. The Senator's note accurately tracking the number of forced sterilizations performed can be problematic. So we've been doing everything that we can to to bring as much data to the forefront as possible. However, that's one of our recommendations is to get a very reliable data system in and um, to be able to know for sure how many how many people have been sterilized against their will. And Adette says since provincial governments have not been successful at stopping the practice, it is time for the federal government to take the lead. I hope it will send a message also to uh, the region where I live in Quebec, where this uh, mobilization, when it started, uh, the government didn't want to participate. The Quebec government didn't want to participate to this uh, table or to this dialogue. In an emailed statement, Minister of Indigenous Services Canada Patty Haidu's office told APTN forced sterilizations are a troubling violation of human rights, more must be done, and they will be reviewing the report's recommendations. APTN also reached out to the Canadian Medical Association, but they were not able to provide comment by airtime. Fraser Needham, APTN National News, Ottawa. For more, we're joined by Ontario's Senator Kim Pate. Senator Pate did not participate in the writing of this current report, but she has a lot of familiarity with the issue of forced and coerced sterilizations of Indigenous women from some of her past work in the Senate. Senator Pate, good to have you uh, joining us here today. Uh, we understand you and a number of other senators uh, obviously have been studying this issue for a number of years. Uh, can you give some of our viewers a, a brief background? Sure. I mean, this was issue, an issue first raised by Senator Boyer, who uh, who is trained as a nurse and as a lawyer, and was doing work on this before she came to the Senate. And so she raised the issue with us um, at the Human Rights Committee and really urged that we do a study. She since has also introduced legislation and she continues to do the work on this issue. And so we had two studies, two, a short study in the last session and then a, a longer one this uh, this term and, uh, and produced the result, uh, the scars that we carry, forced and coerced sterilization of persons in Canada with a particular focus on Indigenous women. 
Uh, as you mentioned, you know, uh, Senator Boyer has also brought forward a private member's Senate bill. Uh, can you talk a bit about that? Well, it's interesting because she brought forward the bill in large part, as I understand it, because of the push of uh, individual, particularly women who had faced forced sterilization. Uh, from my perspective, and as I said when witnesses were before the committee, we already have provisions in the criminal law that cover these areas, and in fact, uh, it is illegal that, uh, and, and against the criminal law, that forced sterilizations have happened. It's considered uh, assault. It's also considered, it could be considered fraudulent, where people are given misinformation. Um, and certainly we know that, as, as in the example of, that many people know about now, of um, mistreatment of Indigenous women in other contexts, such as Joyce Eshaquan's at the Joliet Hospital, uh, of the long history of breaches of charter and human rights uh, for individuals in in the healthcare system is well documented, as well, of course, by the work that uh, was done on the West Coast um, by Mary Ellen Terpel Lafond uh, following the, the Eshaquan and, and some other complaints about uh, racist and discriminatory attitudes in the uh, healthcare system in BC. The report highlights the need for criminalization of forced sterilization, compensation for victims, and the need for some sort of uh, national data bank for tracking. What are some of the other recommendations you think are worth noting? Well, I think those are really important. The fact that it's not well documented. Also, the fact that there's not a lot of public education. As uh, Senator Boyer said in the press conference today, and as was uh, evident when the witnesses came before the Human Rights Committee, there are many people, and in fact, as this, has, as this study has become more public and as people have spoken about it, whether it's me, whether it's Senator Boyer, whether it's Senator uh, Wanda Thomas-Bernard, Senator Toulajan, uh, in various communities, women have come forward we're talking about the fact that this same situation happened to them, whether it's because they're poor, racialized, maybe have some mental health issues. Uh, so the history, the genocidal impact, the history of the eugenics movement in this country has long uh, not only historical roots, but seems to have continued on. And, and you know, when we have cases as recently as in the last couple of years, it's evident that this is an ongoing issue. So the need for public education, um, as well as education of doctors to ensure that they understand what they're doing, that they can't just impose their own moral judgment um, around what they think is appropriate and who should and should not have uh, the ability to uh, have children is, is vitally important. Senator Pate, we'll have to leave it there, but appreciate you speaking with us today. Thank you very much, and thank you for all the work you do. We want to hear what you think about forced sterilization. Here's how you can continue the conversation. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on our website. That's aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. RCMP in Manitoba are renewing their plea for information in the disappearance of a 16-year-old girl who went missing in northern Manitoba two years ago. Tammy Nataway went missing in July 2020. She was described as a kind, quiet and shy girl from Kistigan Joaquin, also known as Garden Hill First Nation. Tammy was not known to go off by herself. The RCMP and community members searched extensively when she disappeared. At the time, RCMP said foul play was not suspected. Now they say investigators do suspect foul play. Tips are coming in, but anyone with information is asked to contact Island Lake RCMP. An addictions worker from Lac La Croix First Nation in Treaty 3 territory is walking to help raise awareness of the opiate crisis in the area. Justin Voshi feels not enough is being done to help people he sees suffering in the community. Investigative journalists Kenneth Jackson and Cullen Crozier caught up with Boshi on his daily journey. I'm 38 years sober, I'm 68 years old, and I'm a very caring person. Right now, I have a goal to reach 100,000 100, steps for the awareness of the 
opiate crisis that's around us. I have a heart for them. We need to help them. They need help. They are our children. They are our people. Canada has to be there for them. The province has to be there for them. They need to create programs that are uh, appropriate to these people, where they, they're not treated as criminals. But some of them are victims. I'm sorry. Um, we, um, on Monday, a young First Nations woman OD'd. Her life, she was brought back with uh, Narcan. Um, and then later that day, a 17-year-old First Nations boy that was in care all of his life almost OD'd outside the family center where they, where it was kind of the last spot on the you know, le- you know end of the road. Those are two lives almost gone. There's a lot of people around him who don't think they're going to survive much longer. Is that why you're walking? That is why I'm walking. I'm walking because we need to nurture our people. Like uh, right now, everybody looks at everything as to be punitive. You don't punish people like, you know, trying to sober up trying to ask for help. You don't drive them away. Even if they're on it, find a way to help them. I believe in saving lives. I don't believe in a, abandoning people that are out there. I think we, we have to find a place for them to, to recover because they can be a contributing part of the society if you give them that opportunity. And you need to give them that opportunity to, to, to go on with their lives. And that's what I believe in. When I help people, I want to take them that extra mile to, to achieve a, their sobriety and you know, go on with their life. You can see more of Kenneth and Cullen's work on Investigates coming up in the fall. Time for a quick break. Coming up here, not much hope in the Pope's upcoming visit to Canada. I believe that once the Pope is gone and the media hype dies down, uh, we will be forgotten again. Welcome back. With the approaching papal visit, APTN's Chris Stewart sat down with Clinton John Marty. Marty says he was abused for years while in Catholic school. He shares his thoughts on what the Pope's visit and apology mean to him. Well, that's when they tried to Clinton John Marty was profiled in a 2019 episode of APTN Investigates. Marty is Métis and spent years being abused while in the care of the Catholic Church. The horrific incidences still repeat themselves with frequent nightmares. Was abused physically, sexually, mentally, as well as um, medicated. Um, And uh, the trauma of the, the time there continues to this day. And seeing more of the images from the residential schools that have been popped up lately has just flooded so many more memories. <laughs> Marty had to overcome alcohol addiction. He raised a family. The trauma made him unable to hold down a job. He says he and abuse survivors have a lot of anger to forgive. I've been screaming for years, abuse, 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 and nobody listened. And I'm sick of people not listening and, and ignoring us. The Pope can come right to my door and apologize to me, but it won't make a lick of difference because he's doing it generalized. He's doing it because he feels he has to. Does he truly want to? Does the church truly want to? That's the question. Marty says the Pope's visit may not heal himself, but he knows other abuse survivors will find it healing. For him, he couldn't remain a Catholic. There was too much damage done. The Holy Father himself, not Francis, but all the ones prior were just as guilty of molesting, beating, and killing children 
in those schools as the priests that did it and the nuns that did it. There is no difference. And so, to me, once that older generation is gone, religion, well, I believe, will have no point at all in our healing. Marty did not attend a residential school, but, like many others, were placed in the care of Catholic-run homes. He did not qualify for compensation. He is part of a class action suit against the province of Alberta and Child Services. I believe that once the Pope is gone and the media hype dies down, uh, we will be forgotten again. And there will be many of us. There's hundreds if not thousands of us who were abused that do not fall under federal jurisdiction. We fall under the jurisdiction of provincial government of Alberta and the Children's Services. Um, and they continue to fight us in court to this day. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. A deadline has come and gone for survivors to sign up for the Federal Indian Day School class action, but a six-month extension has been announced. It would give those who apply until January 13th of 2023 to submit their applications for the $1.47 billion settlement with the Government of Canada. Federal Indian Day School survivors who have not filed their claim for compensation could get a six-month extension. About 150,000 people have filed so far. That's already more than initial estimates. If you missed the July 13th deadline, you can now send in an extension request form, though you'll need to state a good reason for missing the deadline. Under the original settlement agreement, day school survivors could get between ten dollars and $200,000, depending on the level of harm they experienced. Survivors, families and leaders have been continuously requesting an extension of the deadline for months. The Anishinaabek Nation says the entire process has been an injustice to survivors of Indian day schools. You can find much more information on the Federal Indian Day School class action lawsuit over on our website, aptnnews.ca. Time for one more quick break. When we return, Rebecca Belmore takes on the monumental task of decolonizing the Ottawa artscape. All the toppling of the John A. Macdonald monuments and all that, all that jazz. Like we have to rethink what a monument is. Welcome back. Let's take a look at our photo of the day. And this one comes from our Yellowknife Bureau. Sarah Connors was able to capture this picture of some baby birds that live on the roof of her bureau. Sarah tells us they're now big enough to fly on their own. If you want your name on national TV, send us one of your great pictures to share at aptn.ca with a chance to be our photo of the day. Now let's take a look at Friday's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, 26 with showers for Halifax, rain and 23 in St. John's, 21 with showers in Kuduak, 8 with rain in Nain, 27 in Montreal, sunny and 24 in Shibugamu, 24 for Sault Ste. Marie and North Bay, 25 in Thunder Bay, 28 for Sioux Lookout. In northern Manitoba, 29 for God's Lake and Norway House under sunny skies. 29 in Winnipeg, 30 for Barron's River and Dauphin. 32 with showers in Regina, 35 with rain in Saskatoon. 31 in Meadow Lake and La Ronge. In northern Alberta, 26 and sunny for Fort McMurray and Fort Chip. 28 in Edmonton, 32 for Lethbridge. Sunny and 23 in Vancouver, 30 in Kamloops. 18 with showers in Prince George, 16 with rain for Smithers. 15 in Old Crow, showers and 19 in Whitehorse. 22 with rain in Yellowknife.
cloudy and 16 in Norman Wells. Four with a chance of snow in Saks Harbor, plus seven in Politech. 19 in Baker Lake, 21 for RVF. 14 and sunny in Resolute, 22 in Akalawi. clarification to make now as our photo of the day came from Whitehorse and not Yellowknife. Back to Ottawa where a new artwork was unveiled at the National Art Centre last week by a renowned First Nations visual artist. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. When people think of iconic symbols in the nation's capital, they likely think of the Parliament buildings, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, or maybe even the National War Memorial itself. But artist Rebecca Belmore wants to change that with this piece that she calls Dawn. The point was to, to contrast what's going on in this site in terms of like a, like a, it's a national site, it's the nation's capital. And of course, as Indigenous people, we have a very difficult relationship still today with, with the government and uh, you know, the crown, so to speak. It's a 30-foot long fallen tree representing wood taken from First Nations people by colonial settlers. The oversized jingles are a jingle dress symbolizing healing, and an eagle, often present at jingle dances, oversees it all. The National Gallery of Canada's Michelle Lavallee said Belmore is known for creating impactful visual art, and her latest work is no different. In appreciation and awe of the quiet strength of this monumental anti-monument, I revel in its quietness and evocative solitude, anticipating the moment that it takes flight and sound. Elder Verna McGregor spoke about what the piece means to her. And this area has seen the biggest extraction of timber to build a ships in Europe. So when I look at that, I, I, that's what came to mind, but also too as well, you see the jingles up here. For me, my interpretation is it's a jingle dress which represents healing. Belmore said because of the COVID-19 pandemic, Dawn took four years to complete, and she noted a lot has changed during this time, including Indigenous people leading the way in the removal of colonial symbols and monuments. And she said she wants to be part of this historical change. And if you think about it, during this time, all the toppling of the John A. Macdonald monuments and all that, all that jazz, like we have to rethink what a monument is, and like we have to rethink how we, how we mark our histories. You know? Don will sit permanently in the main atrium of the National Arts Center. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. Quite a work. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. For news anytime or for more on anything you've seen here, you can head over to our website, aptnnews.ca. Now stick around an encore presentation of the APTN News political show, Nation to Nation, with Brett Forrester is just minutes away. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.